Hello, welcome to Northwest Christian Church. I hope you're having an awesome Sunday morning. I'm glad that you're able to join us this morning for our online worship service. I encourage you to gather the family around uh, to prepare the service together and enjoy the service together. I'm pre-recording this, so I'm, I guess I'm just going to prophetically predict that we just had our first Zoom Sunday School class and that it went great, I think, I hope. Um, but we, had our, we have our Zoom Sunday School classes uh, every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And if that's something that you missed out on this Sunday uh, and you want to catch future ones, please let us know. Uh, give us our, your email address. You can text it to me. You can call me. You can send it in a message. You can go onto our website, fill out our contact form there on our website, nwccalta.com. And I'd love to get that invite to you. But we do need your email address. We're not going to put that invite out publicly, especially on social media. So we need to get your email address first before we can just send out that uh, invite to you personally. But if you want to be a part of future Sunday School classes through Zoom, uh, we'd love to have you. So give us your email address through all the different, different forms you can use to communicate with me, with one of the elders, and we'd love to get you to be a part of future Zoom Sunday School classes. We're going to start this Sunday morning with songs of praise and worship. What a friend we have in Jesus. Sounds nice. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, our sins and griefs to bear. to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfend. Oh, what needless pains we bear. Trials and temptations. Yes, there are troubles everywhere. We should never be discouraged. So take, let's take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? And come burn with the boat of care. Pray. Savior, still our refuge. So take, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. And do thy friends despise for Oh, 
We're also going to be having a reading of the psalm. And so if you want to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 47, if you have the NIV, you can read out loud. Uh, if you have a different version, you can read along, but your words won't exactly match mine, so it might be a little difficult to read out loud with me. But if you have the NIV, you can read out loud with me. We're going to be in Psalm 47. I'll give you a moment to turn there in your Bibles. But our Psalm 47 begins here in verse 1. It says, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome the great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy thrones. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of, of the God of Abraham, for the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. I'd like to enter into a time of prayer, and so if you have any requests or updates that you would normally share at our in-person services, please let us know. You can give me a call. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, send us a text or, or a, a message on our church Facebook page. We'd love to hear about what God is doing in your life and how we can be better praying for you or serving you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we devote this time this morning to you. I pray that you would focus our hearts and minds on you, that you would be our hope and our deliverer in this time of, of stress and just unique challenges. So I pray that we would make our highest priority you and making your name famous among the nations. God, it's in your name that I pray these things. Amen. Also at this time, I would encourage you to press pause and take time, a time of communion with your family. Again, I don't know if you have exact bread and grape juice available, but you can make do with some other uh, food or, or beverage that you have. But take a moment and remember what Christ has done for you on the cross. The covenant that he established with each of us by spilling his blood and breaking his body. And so we remember that by breaking bread of some kind together and, and drinking uh, wine of some form, some juice, if, if you have that available. And so take a moment to remember what Christ did for you on the cross with your family during this time. Also, if you have any gifts that you would like to give to the church, you can always mail them in to P.O. Box 85, Alta, Iowa, 510. Zero two. Also, we got a chance to meet this last elders this last Tuesday for an elders meeting, and one of the other things we came up with was if you're not comfortable sending your gifts in the mail, I get that. Uh, if you want, you can always reach out to me or one of the elders, and we would love to come to your house and, and pick that up and make sure that your gifts get to the right place safely and securely. Uh, so if that's something that you would rather do, uh, please let me know. Please let one of our elders know. We'd love to come and get that from you to make sure that that gets taken care of. So if you have any gifts, you can always mail them in or just let us know and we could even come to you and pick them up. We're going to be starting a new series this morning. Uh, we're going to be going through a series of sermons over the next nine weeks, studying the various sidekicks and side characters of the book of Acts. And I'm intrigued by the idea of these sidekicks and side characters because I really like the idea of a sidekick. A sidekick is someone who exists purely for the purpose of advancing the story of the hero, right? You don't read comics to learn about Robin. Robin exists purely for the purpose of advancing the story of Batman. You don't read Lord of the Rings to learn about Samwise Gamgee. Samwise exists purely for the purpose of advancing the story of Frodo Baggins. And I love that idea of a sidekick, someone who exists purely for the purpose of advancing the story of a hero, because it's such an excellent picture of the Christian life. We exist purely for the purpose of advancing the story of the hero. And of course, the only hero in all of human history that has ever mattered is Jesus Christ. So we exist purely for the purpose 
of advancing the story of Jesus Christ. And yeah, I think sometimes we get this backwards. We get these roles reversed. And sometimes we think that Jesus is our sidekick, that Jesus exists purely for the purpose of advancing our story. And time and time again throughout Scripture, you see people make these make the same mistake. They treat Jesus as their sidekick. They think that for some reason the story revolves around them, that they are the hero of the story. And what happens every time we see that occur is that whenever someone treats themselves like the hero of the story, they end up acting like the villain. And we see men and women of God throughout Scripture try to reverse their roles, take the spotlight, and they end up failing time and time again in character and in behavior because they've got this idea mixed up. They think that somehow Jesus is their sidekick rather than accepting their role as Jesus's sidekick. So that's why I wanted to study the sidekicks, these side characters, these smaller characters that sometimes can slip into the margins of the stories in the book of Acts, because I think they give us such a great example of the Christian life. They can lead for us an awesome example. We can learn a lot from these small characters because they seem to really understand their role in this story. They exist purely for the purpose of advancing the story of Jesus Christ. So we're going to be going over different side characters throughout the book of Acts. And so if you want to bring out your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, we're going to find our first side character here in the first chapter. And the first side character that we encounter in Acts is this man called Matthias. Now, you may be familiar with that name. If, if you're not, I'll give you a little background on Matthias. Last week, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus resurrects from the dead and he walks about on this earth alive again for the period of 40 days. And during that time, he's going to be witnessed alive again by hundreds of people. But after 40 days, he's going to return with his disciples to the city of Jerusalem and he's going to ascend into heaven. Now, before he ascends into heaven, Jesus gives his disciples these instructions to remain in Jerusalem until his spirit comes. And then after giving them that instruction, he ascends up into heaven. And so the 11 disciples, they return into Jerusalem and they do what Jesus told them to do. They wait. And it's them and, and with the, the other close followers of Jesus, of uh, friends and family at this point, they say the number there is about 120 people sitting in a house in Jerusalem wondering probably the same question, what's next? What now? I mean, Jesus, for all intents and purposes, is gone. And so I can imagine the question on everyone's mind is, is this it? Has it really come to an end? And, and they're just waiting, and they, they wait for a period of, of several days with nothing happening. And I can imagine some may have even walked out the door. Maybe some returned home thinking this is, this is the end. Jesus is, is gone. This is the last three years of our life following him, watching him die, watching him rise from the dead, but now it's over. And it's during this time, this time of uncertainty in the, the church's life, this early time in the church's life, that Peter stands up amongst all the believers and he decides it's time to take care of a little business. See, when Judas betrayed Jesus, he ultimately would go on to commit suicide and that would leave an opening in the disciples, an opening in the apostles. There's 11 apostles. And so Peter looks to the Psalms to find some kind of precedent for replacing this 12th apostle with someone new. And so he said, therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who has been with us the whole time that Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two men you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry with which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven apostles. 
And so we see Matthias, someone who we know very little about, take this position that is probably not a very honorable position. I mean, I'm sure there are some people who are more than happy to leave that position vacant for the rest of time. Who wants to be known as Judas Iscariot's replacement? Who wants to step up into leadership of a movement that honestly at this point could go absolutely nowhere? I mean, when Matthias takes this role, he is giving up his life back home. He is giving up any hope of ever going back to normal. And again, the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet in Pentecost. And so at this point, I can't help but wonder if they're wondering, is anything going to come of this? What kind of position is Matthias stepping up to fill? And so there's a few things that we can learn from Matthias' appointment as an apostle. The first thing that we learn from Matthias in this whole occurrence before Pentecost is that Matthias stepped up. Matthias had the faith and the willingness to step up into leadership in the church. And Christian leadership is a tricky thing, but I think for all of us, we should be striving. We should be willing to step up into Christian leadership. Now, I know that can be confusing for some of us because we might have different, maybe even worldly ideas of Christian leadership. But Christian leadership ultimately isn't a title that is thrust upon you by a vote of the congregation. Christian leadership is the act of making disciples. And that's something all of us are called to be. Maybe none of us, maybe we're not necessarily called to be elders or deacons, but all of us are called to be making disciples. And the moment we go about trying to make disciples, we are striving for Christian leadership. All of us should be desiring to be Christian leaders. That's why Paul describes the act of trying to be an elder or be like an elder as the good work. Because in order to make disciples, you must have Christ-like character. You can't make disciples without Christ-like character. And so when we decide that we need to make disciples, that we're going to make that our highest priority here on this earth, that we're going to step up and try to lead others and, and have them follow us while we go and follow Christ, it requires that we have Christ-like character. And so striving to be an elder or or like an elder, that is the good work that all of us should be striving towards. Maybe you'll never actually get that title yourself in this life, but if you can get that character, then you will lead others to be like Christ. And so my argument is this. If you're not trying to be a leader in the church, if you're not trying to be a Christian leader amongst your friends and family, what are you striving for in this life? What, are, what, are you, what is the goal of your faith during this time here on earth? If it's not striving for Christian leadership, then I don't know what else it could be. All of us should be striving to lead the church. And again, that leadership may not necessarily look like a title that makes decisions in a board meeting. It could look like having a conversation, praying with and for people, trying to meet their needs, trying to sense what they need to hear in their life at this time, and how they can turn around and go and make disciples of other people. That's what Christian leadership looks like in our church, and that's what we should be striving to be. And so that first requires that we have a Christ-like character that results in Christian leadership. And so what I would argue to you is, if you look at our elders and our deacons, you will find people who don't who aren't leaders because they have this burden of leadership thrust upon them. When you look at our elders and deacons, you will find people who are so Christ-like in their character that leading others to be like Christ is just the natural result of their Christ-like character. It, It flows out of them naturally. They can't not be leaders as long as they maintain that Christ-like character and stay out of sin. And again, if you look at our leaders, you will find men and women who are Christ-like in their character. Again, they weren't voted into their position. They exhibited the qualities of Christ-like character, and as a result, they became leaders in our church. And all of us should be striving for that kind of character, the kind of character that just naturally results 
in Christian leadership. And that's what Matthias exhibits to us. Is this was just his character. First and foremost, he would not have been considered if he was not strongly uh, like Christ, if his, his, his leadership was not an obvious to everyone around them. And so Matthias stepped up into Christian leadership. The second thing we learn from this whole occurrence is that God picks his leaders. God picks his leaders. Uh, when we look at this occurrence, one of the things that might stand out to you is how they went about picking these people. They, they found some individuals that met their qualifications, and instead of putting it to a vote or, or trying to choose or appoint one or the other, they basically cast lots, which I don't know exactly what that would have looked like, but I imagine it must have looked something like rolling the dice or even eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Again, there was, these men were free from sin. They met the qualifications. And so rather than taking the responsibility and the, the credit of choosing the next apostle upon themselves, they left that decision up to God in really a way that seemed fair at the time. Uh, you might call it luck that the lot fell to Matthias, but with prayer and with God's church at stake, I can't help but look at this as clearly God at work selecting his leaders. And just the same way that God selected his leaders back then, God selects his leaders to this day. I don't think we need to be casting lots in order to pick our leaders in the church. I think it's great that we vote, and I think God uses those votes to pick his leaders. And so that's what we have to come to terms with as well, is that God chooses the leaders of his church. Yes, because we get to vote, we somehow get more personal involvement with the selection of leaders. We get to cast our vote for someone or possibly even cast our vote against someone. And because of that personal involvement, it can be tempting to take personal responsibility for the ultimate selection of our Christian leaders in our church. But I'll tell you right now, even though we all get together and vote, we all get to have a say in who becomes the leaders in our church, ultimately it is God who decides the leadership of his church. God is fiercely protective of his church. I mean, that's why he goes to such severe lengths when it comes to Ananias and Sapphira just a couple chapters later. God wants to make sure his church is pure and protected from any risks. And so when we pick our leaders and we find the results of the vote or, or the results of the lots, we have to walk away from that situation trusting that God has picked those leaders. And so, don't get me wrong, if, if a Christian leader is in sin, they should clearly be removed from whatever office they've been voted into. But if they're not in sin, if maybe they just rub you the wrong way, if they don't look the way you expect a Christian leader to look like, if their personality doesn't really jive with yours, then that's not a reason for you to somehow discredit God's selection in their life. Ultimately, when we look at our Christian leaders and we look at them free from sin, yes, maybe different personalities or, or, or age brackets, but when we look at our Christian leaders, we ultimately trust that God put them in, those, in that situation, that they, God is the one who selected those people. We don't get to take credit for their selection. God picked, picks the leaders of his church. The third thing, the last thing that we can take away from this passage of Matthias is that ultimately Matthias was qualified to be a apostle of Christ Jesus. But that qualification, well, simple, is available to each and every one of us. Uh, I feel like sometimes we easily disqualify ourselves from ever having any kind of purpose in God's greater plan. When we think about where we fit into God's greater plan, we, we just disqualify ourselves and say, there's, there's no way I could ever contribute to God's mission on this earth. Maybe you think you don't know your Bible well enough. Maybe you think you don't, you're not eloquent enough. Maybe you feel like you don't have enough resources available to you to make that big of a difference. But let me tell you right now that talent or resources or charisma are not qualifications for biblical leadership. They're certainly not qualifications for Matthias. Matthias was qualified because he had been with Lord Jesus from the beginning, and he bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
But I think a lot of us can measure up to that qualification. A lot of us can claim a consistent followership of Jesus Christ. Not a perfect one, but a consistent one. Desiring to be like him. And when we mess up, we repent, we turn from those sins, and we seek to be like him continuously. And as long as we continue to, be, to, to follow Christ, to be like him, to be closer to him each and every day, then we meet that first qualification that Matthias met. We were, we've been with Christ from the very beginning of our journey till now. That we've continuously followed Christ to this moment. The second qualification is bearing witness to the resurrection. And again, I don't know what Matthias did before this. I don't know if he was a particularly talented or, or charismatic or eloquent speaker. All I know is that he saw Jesus was alive. And that had a profound impact on his life. And he was willing to tell others about that impact. And that was what qualified him to be an apostle. And I think each and every one of us have a story to tell about Jesus' resurrection in our life. Each and every one of us has a story of new life that Jesus has provided because of the power of resurrection in our life. So let me ask you right now, do you know what that story is? Could you, could you tell it? It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be eloquent. Could you share it with your friends, your family, and co-workers? If you're willing to do that, then you will qualify for leadership. And so don't think you have nothing to offer. Again, the qualifications for Christian leadership aren't that difficult. And yet, they can be something that we fall short of each and every day. And so my question to you is, are you, have you been with Jesus till now? If maybe you're finding yourself straying from him during the stress of this time, turn to him during this time. And do, are you a witness to his resurrection? What is your story that you can share with other people? And are you willing to share that? And in so doing, you can be qualified for apostolic leadership in the church the same way that Matthias was qualified for that kind of leadership. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I hope that we make you our highest priority, that we would seek to lead others to be like you, God, that our character uh, would be so much like you that that kind of leadership just naturally pours out of us. I pray that you, we would not disqualify ourselves from ever being of service to your story and your purposes, but like Matthias, we would faithfully set up, uh, step up and be your witnesses to the resurrection, to the new life that we've experienced in our own life. God, I pray that you would give us the opportunity to bear witness that story to someone else this week, that we would not miss that opportunity, but we would see you at work in our lives this week. God, it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Have a great week. <laughs>